Well, how y'all doing today? It is September the 13th, 2022. I hope you're having a wonderful day wherever you happen to be. My name is Gary Willing. I want to welcome you to Search for Signs, especially if you're new. Welcome you back if you've been here before. And always point out if you want to know more about this information, you want to see if there's anything to this for yourself, I have included links to websites that give you wonderful background information about what we talk about. So you can look into it or not. I had um, three people since the last time I put a video up. Uh, comment. I want to thank Mark Hill, Spirit, Spirit Watcher 178, and Smoke Doja for taking time out of their day to comment. I appreciate it. And always encourage everyone to uh, join the discussion by commenting or asking questions. You can ask your question by uh, posting your question in the comment section. You can also email me at searchforsigns at mail.com. All right, now I want to dive into um, Mark Hill's question because it's a follow up question, and then I'll swing back by and try and answer Smoke Doja's question. So, Mark. Um, asked a question in the, um, I think it was a previous video, or maybe it was a video before that. doesn't really matter. Anyway, he was wanting to know more about my experiences with Maitreya. And if you want to know more about them too, after hearing about this uh, in this video, I have included a, um, created a uh, playlist on this channel entitled My Maitreya Experiences. How apropos. It's a pretty cool name for that, that playlist. Anyway, if you want to know more about those, you can listen to those. But um, he wanted to know a few of them. I kind of breezed through, uh, I think, three experiences that I had, uh, and he had a follow-up question. So he said, I understand you were able, I understand how you were able to recognize the note written on the payphone as being an act of Maitreya, and I understand how you knew it was Maitreya who helped you with the trash. But how is it you came to see that the little boy who hugged you was Maitreya and not just some odd behavior from another kid? Good question. Similarly, how is one who saw the woman in white able to say that was Maitreya and not just a lady in a radiant garment? So the second question, I can't really answer because that wasn't me. So I'll talk about my experience and maybe we'll kind of give you some insight to it. Now, what, what he's talking about, if you didn't listen to the video, is I'm claiming that Maitreya, um, I had a Maitreya experience when I was in the third grade in about 1982. Yes, I am just that old. <laughs> but uh, in 1982, I was in the third grade. I was eating with my classmates uh, in the cafeteria. And <clears throat> the special needs kids were leaving this one day. And behind the special needs kids was a blonde kid who ended up being Maitreya, who I had never seen before uh, this experience that I had. And he gunned for me, gave me this huge hug, swung me back and forth, it kind of reminds me of uh, the Grapes of Wrath. You know, I love you and make you my own with a mouse or whatever. Really squeezed me pretty hard and said he loved me, he missed me, and, you know, I love you so much, my brother, and all that kind of stuff. And I pushed him away. And he turns around, and Maitreya flashes me this huge smile. And I remember his face quite clearly. And I, he had blonde hair, but I remember the face. And then he left. And then I never, and then I never saw the, the, the kid again. Didn't think much of that experience after that. Didn't think it was Maitreya at the time or anything like that because I didn't know anything about Maitreya. And then I came across um, Benjamin Krem's books in, I think, 94, 95. I can't remember exactly what year it was. It was around that time. So, you know, a little over a decade since uh, the experience I had in the third grade. Now, the payphone message he was talking about was the first experience that I remember that I remembered as being an experience okay it wasn't the first experience I had but it's the first one I remembered and when I was reading my transmission volume two and reading some of the Sharon International magazines I was reading about other people's experiences and the whole time I'm reading this I'm not thinking that I could have ever been someone who had had an experience with my Treya like that never once in a million years thought that that would ever happen even after I started to think that there was some truth to this information. I, there wasn't the first thing that I thought about. Well, maybe I've had an experience with my trade. No, I was the other way. I was thinking, nah, there's no way he would ever communicate with me in that way. And then I started thinking, you know, I was like, you know, that, that payphone experience was kind of extraordinary. You know, oh my gosh, he did sign it as the Christ. Was that him? But I didn't, it took me a while to really bring it up <clears throat> and, and talk about it. But I had thought about it quite a bit since it happened. And there was times that I mentioned it to some friends of mine who don't know anything about this information, and I got all sorts of 
stares and stunned looks. I've also got some explanations that to me were a lot more far-fetched than it being an actual miracle in the way that it was. But, um, you know, they, somebody said that somebody probably bought a ticket from Japan and flew all the way over here and placed it on the phone, wrote it on the phone in that way. And I'm like, well, that, why would they do that? <laughs> it makes no sense. But anyway, that was one explanation. But it, I got a lot of different explanation as, as to how there had to have been a reason why. Maybe I made the thing up in my mind, that kind of thing. So anyway, um, this one night after um, transmission meditation, uh, we're all sitting around talking and a friend of mine, Phyllis, was talking about an experience that she had and I just happened to mention, I was like, you know, I had this crazy experience with this payphone and I started telling everybody in the group that at the time about this. And I remember looking around at some of the, the looks on these people's faces and they weren't stunned silence, they were starting to tear up, you know, as I was telling them this story. And Phyllis goes, Gary, that is, you got to write that into Ben and ask him if that was my trade. That's got to be my trade. There's no way. And I said, I said, Phyllis, the, 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 ah, there's, ah, I'm sorry. There's, that's not true. There's, this not an experience with my trade. It's just something crazy that happened. She goes, no, it had to have been right. There's just, there's too, too much to it. Right. And I ended up writing it in. And of course it was. And then I started kind of thinking back in my life, well, maybe I had another experience with my trade. Right. So then I started thinking about this one. I was like, nah, that's probably not it. And what about that? No, that's probably not it. And then all of a sudden, something kind of popped in my mind about this boy giving me this hug. And I was like, you know, I don't remember ever seeing him before, and I don't remember seeing him after. That was kind of strange. And then I remember looking at the picture of my Maitreya uh, that I had framed. It was a picture of him in Nairobi, Kenya. And I had it framed on my dresser in my um, apartment at the time. And I was like, you know, I remember thinking when I first saw that, I was like, he looked so familiar. And then I started thinking back to this kid. I was like, he kind of looked like him. Even though he was looked young, he was about the same age as me and look, uh, had blonde hair, didn't have a full beard, didn't have this headdress like my trade did in Nairobi, but it looked like him. You know what I'm saying? And then I couldn't get it out of my mind. And then I kept thinking about it over and over again. Was that, was that something? And I, I wrote it into Ben and he said yes. Now, I want to make a couple things clear about this. Okay, so first of all, I know for myself and I know for some other people too, but I'm speaking for myself in this situation that there were a couple, three times that I actually asked Ben if that was my tray, and he said no. So he didn't always say yes. And I felt very deflated sometimes after he said, that wasn't my tray. In fact, what you thought he said, he never even, that person never even said it. It was my illusion. <clears throat> anyway, so I felt some kind of way about that. But the majority of the time, I ended up asking Benjamin Krem if that was my tray. He said yes. Um, the other thing, too, is when I'm talking about seeing my tray, as other people have claimed to have seen. It's a thought form of Maitreya. Maitreya was still in London the times that I saw him. He created this thought form of this boy in this situation as a lesson or whatever for me, you know, as an introduction, or I don't know what, you'd have to ask him why he did, you know, did it. In fact, actually, people even asked Ben, why is he appearing to certain people and not others? Why is he doing it this way and not others, you know, in other ways and so forth? And Ben doesn't really have an answer. He would say only Maitreya would know. So there's a reason why um, he appears to other people and not, a, and, and not other people. But for some reason, I've been lucky enough to remember a lot of experiences um, that I had with Maitreya and recognize him in that way. And sometimes he made it easy for me because he'd say something to me that I might have just been thinking about. I might have had this thought that that could have been Maitreya. For whatever reason, I had that thought, and he would wink at me at that time. That I, right after I had that thought, he would turn to me and wink at me or something, and like, yeah, that's me. <laughs> but he didn't, never came out and said it was him. So it, it's a part of the law of recognition. And when I talk, when I try to answer the the question coming from Smoke Doja, it's kind of in line with that. But you have to recognize him on your own. And a lot of times, I felt elated after seeing him you know, just this wonderful sense of joy that I was almost walking on eggshells for hours or even a day and a half or whatever after I had seen Maitreya that led me to believe that that was him. In fact, actually, if you swing back through my videos and you look back to um, last year, summer of last year, I interviewed a gentleman named Dick Larson who had uh, broken down in five simple ways that you might be able to you know, recognize that you had an experience with one of these masters. He's just posing it as a question. It's not hard and fast rules, but 
One of the ones is you keep thinking about it over and over again, even if it's just a simple wave or a smile, my, my tray, I might wave and smile at you and you keep thinking about who was that guy? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Even though it was just a wave, you know, or other times you might feel, t- you know, down at that moment. And then you see this homeless person on the street and they wave at you or smile and you feel just uplifted and, uh, and elated about it because my tray probably sent, you know, that person a blessing in that way. And I can attest to that, but I always felt something kind of tingling in my heart as, as for lack of a better word, it, but it's almost like, you know, trying to tell somebody when, when you're in love and when you're not, how do you explain when you're in love? You know, you just kind of know it, right? When you're truly in love with a person, it's the same kind of deal. It's like, how would I be able to explain whether that was my tray on that isn't my tray? I don't know. I just, it, it's like, I just know it. But a lot of people, because they don't know anything about this information, might have had experiences with the masters, and you might have been one of them, Mark, I don't know, and <clears throat> haven't recognized it yet or remembered it yet because you weren't thinking about it at the time. Now that you know about this information, Maitreya can actually enter your life without infringing your free will. And this is for everyone, even those people who don't agree with this information at all. He can now enter your life and, and appear to you in the way that he appeared to me without infringing your free will. Or you can see him on TV now without him infringing upon your free will because you now know this information. So now the other thing too is, you know, he might say something quite dramatic, you know, and in reference to something that you were thinking. And this is, this happened um, eh, maybe 10 years ago, I think. My mother came and visited me for Christmas. And she usually stays a few days before Christmas and a few days after. And when she got there, she was kind of down about the state of affairs in the world. And she was telling me that, you know, she was feeling kind of saddened because people weren't as polite as they used to be. People didn't say hello to her like they used to be. They didn't open the door for her, those kind of things. And then she would also kind of tell me she was feeling kind of depressed because she was about to get to be 70, you know, and that was starting to kind of hit her hard, you know. And, you know, she brought it up several times during her visit. And then this one Christmas day, we went to um, the AMC movie theater down the street from my house. And it's a rather large AMC movie theater. And they have a parking deck and so forth. And the, and the theater is on the top floor. And there's a gaming uh, company called Main Event underneath, you know, below this uh, theater. But there's also the parking deck. And I remember parking on the bottom floor of the parking deck this, this go-round. Because it's actually a double-tier parking deck. And they have an elevator that takes you up to the to the theater. So we get in this elevator. My my daughter, my wife, myself, and my mom all get in this elevator. And we go up one floor and the door opens up. And there's this African-American woman dressed from head to toe in nothing but purple. She had a purple scarf, purple hat, purple clothes, purple pants. And some emerald kind of and, and jewel kind of bedazzled like belt and and on her hat was these jewels that were bedazzled and she looked decked out to be going to the movies in the, in the afternoon, you know, but remember my mother was just saying how she was, she was saddened because people didn't say hello to her. Right. Well, the, the door opens up. This woman takes a step in. Actually it was right before she took a step in. She looks at me and she just flashes this huge smile at me. And I remember feeling this radiance of kind of love and, and upliftment. Uh, from just seeing this woman smile. And I already kind of started to think that maybe there was somebody, something to this woman, but I didn't know for sure. I was just kind of, I kept my mouth shut, obviously. But then she looks right at my mother and she goes, hello, just like that. Very dramatic, but very much toward my mother because she had just told my mother, uh, my mother was just talking about how, how down she was in the world because people were telling her, saying hello. And my mother At first she goes, and then she goes, oh, I forgot to say hello. How are you? (laughs) Right? And then she goes right over to my mother, who my mother is not a huggy, huggy person, and and went right into my mother's space (laughs) and hugged her and leaned into her ear. And she goes to my mother, she goes, you look radiant today or something like this. And I'm listening. I'm trying to listen to what she's saying to my mother. And she whispered, and my mother says, I wish I could wear purple like that but at my age I can't wear stuff like this and the woman said well how old do you think I am and she goes my mother goes I don't know how old are you she goes I'm 77 but age is only in the mind you know as a lesson to my mother who was just getting depressed about getting older 
And right when I thought to myself, this could be my Treya, as she's hugging my mother, she leans to me and winks, or looks to me and winks. And then she waves at everyone. She looks very deeply at my daughter and my wife and my mom again and waves to me and then leaves the elevator. I don't remember if she went, I don't even remember if she went into the movie theater with us, to be honest with you. But after that, I just felt so uplifted about that experience. My mother even felt much better about everything. She goes, yeah, see, people say hello now, right? So she, but that was a way of recognizing uh, Maitreya. And there are other times that he said things that were clearly obvious that I had been thinking about, how I had said to people in my life that nobody who couldn't read my mind would not have known. <clears throat> but, and there, the other thing too is I, th- I think about those, those times quite a bit. They're quite very crisp and clear in my mind. Uh, I'm very clear about what they said. Um, what he said was very simple, easy to remember even, but there's always a lesson in there too. Um, I saw him one time, I think kind of how he might look in real, in, in real life in, in, um, in London. Cause like I said, these, the, the way that the, he looks out in these, uh, the way he creates these thought forms for these people, it's just a thought form. It's not really who he is. And that might not be exactly how he looks, but this one time I saw him, he appeared just as Benjamin Krem had described him in, in one of his books, um, like the Maitreya Buddha statues with a very thin chin. Uh, I, he had a mustache, just like the uh, Maitreya Buddha statues. He was about 6'2", six 6'3", six um, which is what Benjamin Krim said his height was. He very broad-shouldered, very thin, but very broad-shouldered. And I couldn't tell his age. He seemed timeless. You know, I couldn't tell if he was old or young. I couldn't, you know, he looked like he was in his 30s, but he also looked like an old soul, like he was older than that. You know, but but full of energy, full of life, very excited, very joyful at the same time. But he was standing right next to a BMW, and I'm very prejudicial, or at least I was. I still kind of am against uh, BMW drivers because they're the worst drivers on the road, man. They're very aggressive. They cut you off. You know, a lot of road rage. And who's my what? What is my Treya standing next to for me? A BMW, the cleanest BMW by the way I'd ever seen. Other people. When they've seen Maitreya, uh, they might have an issue with people who are smokers, and he's smoking a cigarette, or he asks them for a, a cigarette or something, and they get kind of irritated about it, and it's a lesson of, of not to be prejudicial toward other people. Other times, he might ask for a pittance of money. I remember there's this one experience that somebody had that was quite extraordinary, where he kept asking for the same amount of money. It was like 38 cents. Like, who asked for 38 cents, right? In the and the person immediately recognized that it could be my tray and very excitedly gave it to him. And he was, can I have 38 cents? <laughs> this time she, okay, <laughs> you know, gave it a little more reluctantly. And then he kept asking for it over and over and over again. They started getting really irritated with him. And Ben said it was because it was his lesson of teaching him how to, how to give, how to, how to share. But just a little bit of money. I mean, he asked me one time for a quarter. I remember thinking, I was like, what's he going to do with a quarter? <laughs> you can't even buy gum now with a quarter, right? But... I ended up giving him all the money in my pocket, <laughs> but it was, he's other times have asked for a specific amount of money and it was the only money that was in their pocket or their wallet. Like he might ask for 12 bucks and that's all they had in their, and their wallet was $12. You know what I mean? That kind of thing. So that's another indication, but usually it's, you keep thinking about it over and over and again, you feel uplifted or joyful about the experience in a way that you might not ex- have with other experiences that you had. But in other times, like I said, he, might say something to to the person, uh, such as myself, that is something that they've been thinking about for quite some time. <clears throat> so, I mean, he, the other one that I'll say this too, he he met, um, Benjamin Krem talked about it, uh, his daughter, Tara, who, um, I don't know if she believes much in this or not, I don't know. But anyway, she had just had a, a problem with her boyfriend and Maitreya appeared to her as a elderly man in Hyde Park in London and they're walking. He says, may I walk with you? And she says, sure. And he starts talking and he says, you know, I want to give you some advice from an old man to a young woman. She goes, what? And he goes, well, everything has its opposites. So just because you're having a bad year this year, who's to say next year won't be the best year of your life. And he goes, that's why suicide is always a bad option because you just never know what's right around the corner. And then he said to her, he goes, this year you might be thinking that the person who you're with is the most best, most wonderful person in the world. And then next year you can't stand the person. 
Everything has its opposites, always has its opposites. And he said, that's why marriage is so much easier than dating. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, but it was a lesson for her because she was having an issue with her boyfriend at the time. I think they had just broken up, you know. But I, I, you know, what he said to her, I think about all the time in my life. You know, the times that I've been up this year, next year down. This year I'm down, next year up. I mean, everything has its opposites, you know. And, and you don't know what's right around the corner. And when it comes to us as a group, as a humanity... Right now we're in the down part of, our, of, of things, right? Things are looking dark and dismal. But who's to say what's right around the corner might not be the best thing that ever happened to all of us, that we come together as a people because of the principle of sharing, because of starting to manifest the love nature of God in a way that we can't even possibly imagine today. It's all based on energy. So anyway, something to think about. Now I want to... Um, and if I... Oh, by the way, before I get into the next question, if I didn't answer it the way that you wanted me to, Mark, you know, ask me another follow-up question, and I'll try my best to, to answer it, I guess, better the next time. So, But Smoke Doja asked a couple questions, and we'll, we'll talk about this. Um, and he goes, and so far as Maitreya's identity, listen to what Benjamin Krem said, that he moved to London in 1977 and uses a common Middle Eastern name. There's a person who started doing interviews when Krem said he would, and he also moved from India to London in 1977. That's true. Um, uh, Raj Patel did say he moved from India to London uh, from, with his family and so forth. Now, a couple of things about Raj Patel that I want to point out. Now, you might not take this as true, Smoke Doja, whoever you are, but or take it as, you know, okay, changing your mind, but just something for you to look at and for you to consider. Of course, yes, he looks like Maitreya. He's of in Indian descent, you know. He has an English accent, right? But... And yes, he did give an interview right around the time that Benjamin Krem said that uh, Maitreya gave his first interview. Now, one thing is, Ben never said when he gave his first interview. He just made the announcement in January, and Raj Patel gave the interview in January too, I believe. But he, it could have been in 2009 when Maitreya gave that interview, and Benjamin Krem did, you know, withheld that information to the public until January 2010. We don't know. But just throwing that out there, too. The other thing is, um, I have a very dear friend in New York who met Raj Patel some years before this whole debacle happened. And she met him at a dinner party. She, she even told me she was trying to tell everybody, like, and nobody would listen to her. She goes, I met him. I, I met him at a dinner party in New York. And she said he's a wonderful person, but she's nowhere near convinced that he could be a master. But, and Maitreya at the time before the interview, had not left the Asian community of London in that way. He, had, he was there the whole time. He, he appeared to people in familiars, like he did with people like me and others, but for him to travel in that way, he hadn't done it. And so that was the other thing. But the thing that really, the other things that, the other two things that kind of led me to believe that it isn't my, uh, he wasn't Maitreya, or isn't Maitreya, is he denied it. He came right out and said, I'm not Maitreya. I don't know who, even know who you're talking about. Ben said the same thing when Ben said all along that he would never confirm it nor deny it when asked. And then lastly is how he spoke. He spoke so fast and on a, such an intellectually high level, it's very hard to understand him and remember what he said. There was a guy, I, I remember telling, I mean, I told this story several times in reference to Raj Patal. And like I said, I'm just throwing it out there for you to look at. And, it, and the other thing too is, if he ends up being my trade, I'll be the first to tell you I was wrong, but I know I'm not wrong in this regard. But <clears throat> there was a gentleman who approached Ben after one of his lectures one time, and Ben was telling the group this story. And he said that he had actually been invited to hear Maitreya speak in London and went and attended his talk because Maitreya was giving talks uh, in different... of several of the Asia, uh, the Muslim temples in this uh, in the Brick Lane community of London. And he'd give a talk, and there would be world leaders that would show up from time to time, and ordinary people, he, but it was all by invitation only. And people asked Ben, well, wait, what, can I go hear him speak? And he would say, well, my tray would have to invite you and all that kind of stuff. But what, for whatever reason, this guy was invited. And he said to Ben, he goes, he was sitting there, he goes, you don't even have to try to understand what he's saying. It's just you you automatically understand it. It's so easy. And he goes, you don't even have to 
to kind of grapple with whether it's true or not. He said, you just know it to be true based on what he's saying. And he didn't say anything out of the ordinary. He didn't use words that we don't normally use. He said, you could just feel that it was true based on what he was saying. And you didn't get, I never got that sense from Raj Patel. In fact, I say this all the time. I don't even remember what the guy said. I had to listen back to that interview three or four times just to try to get the gist of what he was saying. So that, to me, would be an indication that it isn't him. <clears throat> but I'm just going off of my information. You're going off on what you think is true. And like I said, if, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But I don't think I am in this situation. But um, the other thing you wanted to say, and I want to talk about this before it gets too long, uh, not trolling, want a serious discussion, Gary. And that's, I'm all for serious discussions and not so much for trolling, that's for sure. If my trade is the Christ, why not let himself be known? Jesus let everyone know who he was. And, okay, let me talk about that real quick and I'll get to the next one. Did Jesus let everybody know? From what I read in the Bible, he didn't. And it wasn't until um, Peter said who he thought he was in private with, with all the disciples and Jesus that Jesus finally admitted who he was. But up until that point, he didn't go around telling people who he was. And a lot of the things that were written in the Bible about, <clears throat> you know, Jesus being this and Jesus being that were symbols, you know. According to Ben's master, it was a very, very tiny number of people who knew who Jesus was, even as a teacher. He wasn't even very famous, you know, but you look at the movies now and there's thousands upon thousands of people listening to him. There wasn't even that many people in Palestine that would be interested in hearing what he had to say. In fact, he, he said that when, when uh, in the night before they, the soldiers took Jesus to go before Pontius Pilate, they had to pay Judas to point him out because they didn't even know who he looked he was I mean you got to think there was no tv there was no internet there was no mass communications in that in that way so just because he was speaking in Palestine doesn't mean that everybody in Palestine knew who he was but he didn't even go around claiming who he was in fact when Pontius Pilate said are they're saying you're the king of the Jews is that true and he said you said it you said it I don't think Jesus ever really claimed to be the only true son of God for sure. But I don't, I think he, he probably said he's the Christ, but it might not have even been Jesus saying it. It was them recognizing Maitreya within him. But I know you're going to think that's blasphemy, but that's just what I think. But in terms of making himself known, it's for the same reason that I had said before is Maitreya is speaking to humanity on TV now in the way that he's doing so that people won't just follow it based on them believing he's Maitreya or disprove it in their mind or not believe what he's saying to be true because they believe him to be the Antichrist. So you can sit there and you can listen to it and listen to what he has to say in simple honesty. And then you could say, yes, this makes sense or no, this doesn't make sense. And feel free to make up your mind in that way without any kind of uh, obligation in your, within yourself that you should believe it based on this or not believe it based on that. So that that from what Maitreya even says is the only way that we will as a people learn to not come back to this this situation again you know so if he had if he makes this claim that he's the one away to all the world's religions of course there'll be people who will believe him based on that because it's true there'll be other people that won't believe it based on the fact of their religious dogma and it'll create confusion within their mind some will follow him outright because he says that and not not really even want for the world what he's advocating for the world or even have take the time to, to look within to see if it's true. So that's why it's important for him just to use an ordinary name to not be recognized as Maitreya. But we will see all at the same time. We'll hear him all at the same time on the day of declaration when he says who he is. So, you know, I guess be patient. <laughs> but it's not sitting in the dark. It's not any kind of sinister plan behind it. it's really because of the free will of all of us and all of humanity that he's not trying to violate but it's a quite a foreign concept for us to think about because of the fact that we don't live our lives like that we all infringe upon each other's free will so hopefully that answers that question <clears throat> now you also said alice bailey started lucia's trust which is used to be lucifer trust that's true before they changed their name so you guys believe lucifer is a master then no i do not that's <laughs> But I want to explain that a little bit. And you said you're being serious here. Um, Lucifer comes from the Latin word meaning bringer of light. So when you rate a brightness of light, a bulb or whatever, it's all based on lux, which is the derivative or the, the Latin root of light, 
Affer means bringer of. So anytime you hear that in Latin, that's what that means. So it's a bringer, a light bringer, a bringer of light. Now I I talked about it in a video before about the the esoteric meaning of who and what Lucifer is, and it's not an angel, it's not a um, it's not Satan. It was hijacked somewhere along the lines, and that's what people now think him to be. But it has to do with the oversoul of humanity. We are all fragmented parts of one soul called the oversoul or Lucifer, which is what was in the Bible as, as when they were writing Lucifer, that's what they meant. Now I'm going to explain why, I, why and how I think it got to where, it, where we have such a distorted view of that. But at the same time, when Alice Bailey wrote and, you know, her books and it, you know, she used the Lucifer Trust and then they changed it to Lucius Trust or whatever. You know, that, then the word and concept Lucifer might have meant something totally different. You know, I mean, I remember, and, and this is another example of it. It's the swastika. This is a really good example of it, right? I mean, if I say the word swastika, right, everyone always thinks some of the, about Hitler and the Nazis, right? Because that was their symbol on their flag, right? Well, that's not where it originated. It's one of the many cross symbols that, that uh, are out there. There's the cardinal cross, which is what Christians mainly look at in terms of, of it's a longer um, vertical piece and a shorter um, horizontal piece. That's the cardinal cross. So when people see that, they think of Jesus. There's also the Aquarian cross, equal uh, horizontal pieces and equal um, uh, vertical pieces. That has a whole new meaning, a different meaning, as above, so below. And then you have the swastika, which has its own esoteric meaning of behind that. And I remember being, um, when I was a kid, I was playing at my friend Mark's house. And his father was in the Vietnam War. And when he was in Vietnam, he bought this wonderfully beautiful golden Buddha statue. And in the heart of it w was a swastika. Now, it wasn't tilted like the Nazis had it. It was, it was um, you know, like a regular cross, but it looked like a swastika. So it was kind of turned counterclockwise to where it was even. Now, nowadays... When you, you know, when you see that swastika, and I might have even said something, that's something to do with the Nazis or what? And he goes, no, 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 that has nothing to do with it. That's in Buddhist culture because his mother was a Buddhist. That had, um, even though he was, they were from Cuba, that was where his family was from. But he said it had something to do with the Buddhist belief. But if you look at it now, 99.9% .9 of the people would say that was, uh, had to do with, with Nazism and the persecution of the Jews. And that's evil and that's this. But it's not an evil symbol. It's just a symbol. So, but they used it and they hijacked it, and now everybody believes that that's that. So, would if I was Alice Bailey today, would I use that as the name of my trust? No, because <laughs> it it brings up and it conjures up all these all this confusion in the minds of people about what Lucifer is to them. You know, words change meaning over time. You know, back in the seventies, it was everything, or in the eighties, everything was bad, man. That's bad, man. But were they saying it was bad? No, bad meant good. <laughs> you know. So it's the same kind of deal. It's just, uh, but Lucifer is not a being like a master would be. It's the oversoul. It means the oversoul of humanity. But believe it or not, as they say in Ripley's, believe it or not, believe that or not, it's up to you. You know, I'm just telling you the esoteric meaning of it. And I mean, I'm going to eventually have time where I can connect with this person, but he's a friend of mine I met through this channel who went in great detail about where the the idea of Lucifer as Satan came from, and I, I'm not that familiar with her, but he was very much familiar. That was quite extraordinary. So anyway, that is my two cents on that. So if you have any other questions, guys, feel free to post them. You guys take care. Have Remember a great day. Take we'll talk action. to you soon. And help SOP save our planet. Thanks for listening, and we look forward to talking to you again in future videos. Thank you.